So, uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. It's um, somehow quite a surprise to um, to be here and to see that the uh, the retreat is actually happening. It wasn't at all sure that it would uh, take place. It's um, first, although Sunim has been in Sweden before, um, this is the very first uh, attempt we do at, at having a, a proper retreat. So very happy to see all of you here. And um, I have no teaching credentials, at least not in Zen Buddhism. I haven't given any such talk before, but Sunim asked me uh, to, um, to say something as an introductory. So I admit uh, to being slightly nervous. I don't have a script, we'll see what comes out. Um, sitting in meditation before, I thought how very peculiar it is to um, be sitting in the company of others, yet feeling the solitude as um, poignantly as you do in retreat. It's quite special, it's quite something to to be uh, alone, so to speak, in the company of others, or to be with others in solitude. Um, such an unusual combination of uh, things we all know. To be with others, to be together, and then to be alone. Uh, you know, two um, poles often felt to be very far apart, uh, one from the other. And in meditation we, we, we bring them together, don't we? There's this fusion of, of that polarity. And I think that having studied a few religions, only superficially but still, for some time, if something is special about uh, Zen Buddhism, it's the um, characteristic of bringing what seems to be opposite together. Uh, you see so many cases of this. You see, for example, as Sunim mentioned before, how Zen is created in the meeting, the uh, totally new encounter between Taoism in China and this Indian imported religion that is Buddhism. Uh, so two different uh, styles, two different traditions blending and, and something beautiful is created that way. You see it in the Korean tradition in the um, distinction made traditionally between the Gyo and the Son, between the scholarly monks and the meditation monks. And how uh, the famous monk Chinul uh, brought together the two schools. Uh, a thousand years ago, and that's almost, and that's when, when Korean Buddhism really started to flourish. And you see it in the practice also, in the way we, um, we are encouraged to study and to analyze, certainly, and to remember, but also to experience non-verbally. I remember ten years ago sitting in a cafe in London reading a lovely little book, um, by um, Japanese priest uh, Shunryu Suzuki, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. The three to four years prior to that I had been studying Theravada Buddhism, the southern Buddhism you find in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, very close to the traditional uh, teachings of the, of the Buddha. And if you've read any books and belonging to that tradition, you, you know that they are very rational, most of the, of the time at least, that's my understanding. It's about lists, the four foundations of mindfulness and the 16 steps of the um, awareness of breathing, meditation. And You will have the um, eight precepts and 12 precepts and the 257 precepts. And it's all very, very well explained by the Buddha in this uh, typical style where a novice asks the Buddha, Lord, 
is this correct understanding or is this correct understanding? And then the Buddha tells them apart. Incorrect understanding, perfect understanding. And then he repeats it three times, typically. So quite close to philosophy in the Western tradition, quite close to Western religion as well, in some ways. I had been studying that kind of Buddhism and I was very happy with it because it pays attention to the tiniest details in, of everyday life, how you talk to people, how you eat, how you take a shower. It's all within this great framework. It's all meticulously explained how to do things the right way and the wrong way. And it's a bit dry also. And so I read this book by, by Suzuki Roshi. Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And it was kind of in that vein still. Very easy to understand, very rational, rational, adapted to a Western audience. Anyone could get it, really. There is no Zen poetry in it, I wouldn't say. There are no mysterious uh, utterances that you have to sit for months to decode, kind of. Nothing like that. It's basically a manual how to live a, a good life or a happy life, sort out some problems. And then you get to the very last page and the very last sentence. Do you know it? No? So after having explained how to solve everyday problems that uh, we suffer from in the West, in a very um, matter-of-factly, plain, easy-to-understand, kind of self-help way. There is this line. In Japan, in the spring, we eat cucumbers. Full stop. <laughs> in Japan, in the spring, we eat cucumbers. That was the end of the book. That just blew my mind. I was sitting in that street, ca street side cafe and suddenly the, the, uh, the noise of the street in this North London neighborhood just penetrated my whole being. There was the, the uh, traffic noise just amplifying, amplifying, amplifying until I had to leave the cafe. It was so strong. Suddenly there were no filters whatsoever, I felt at least. What's happening to me, I thought. Something had happened. Later that night, I was sitting in a bus and the, uh, the lights, street lights and the lights from the cars passing, they were so strong, so incredibly strong. Again, I felt as there were no filter. I had no, nothing of that jaded palette that we tend to have. When we are born, we perceive everything very clear without any filters. And then we learn how to uh, tell what's important apart from what's not important. Who to shake hands with, who to smile at, what to read, what to ignore, what to think and what not to think, where to go and not to go. We learn to, to um, just forget about or deny all that seemingly useful information that our, our sensory organs bring us. Uh, and suddenly I didn't have that filter, it felt. And um, then that experience deepened for some time. And it seemed true to me that what Suzuki had written was actually true, that there is no difference in the significance between preaching as he did to a congregation and doing the dishes. There really it was so hard to see that there would be a scale of importance, you know, and that this is an important task and that's just something to do as soon as possible and be done with it. They were all at the same level, it felt. And I think that the fact that I had studied Theravada texts and then gotten a taste of this uh, Zen poetry condensed in that little sentence, that combination actually, is the reason I had such a strong experience. So something about bringing opposites together. We do it in, in physical life, it's kind of natural to us still. Less so than before, but still we sleep at night and we 
stay awake during the day. Uh, in nature, you see the polarity too. There's winter and there's summer. We're supposed to go hungry and then eat. Then hungry, then eat. It doesn't work like that anymore, of course. But there is a natural polarity um, encompassing most of ex existence, I think. And if something is wrong with society today, I think it could be the blurring of or the imbalance between such poles or the, the, um, the blurring of them, the non-constructive blurring of them. I read in a study recently that um, in America only 20% of, of adults feel hunger. That's not the reason they eat. They don't eat because of hunger. They eat because they are supposed to eat during the lunch break. There's, they are stressed and they eat for that reason. Or they eat because you know, they need to have fun and so it's culinary um, entertainment. So they never go hungry. 80% of Americans reported that, no, I'm never hungry. And the same thing is happening to our sleep patterns. A lot of people don't get into a deep state of sleep. A lot of people are very sleepy during daytime. <laughs> so there's this blurring. Yeah? And when it comes to solitude and togetherness, I think that possibly this is a very good practice to learn both being together and to be alone to be alone together with others. There was a truly brilliant uh, British psychoanalyst called Donald Winnicott who wrote an essay once about the capacity to be alone. And he said that as a little child it's very important to learn to be alone in a room with others, to play on your own. Only then can you mature and eventually be someone who's good with others and good alone. I don't know of many other opportunities except for a Zen room to do that kind of practice. To be alone together with others. So if, if Zen is of any importance, if there is any potential in this practice, I, I think one would be that it clarifies um, these opposites initially and then they are brought together. Um, you study the text and you do the meditation. There is knowledge and experience. You see it also in the, uh, in the, um, in the symbolism, perhaps, of Buddhism. You, um, you have the two, for me at least, the two main bodhisattvas. Uh, the bod bodhisattva of wisdom and the bodhisattva of compassion. So Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara. Someone said that they are the two uh, wings of, of a bird. The bird cannot fly without both of them. So you study and you study yourself and existence. That's Manjushri, perhaps. And then you and cultivate your own awakening. And then you care about the awakening of others, all sentient beings. And that's uh, the Bodhisattva of compassion. So when they are brought together, something beautiful appears. So it's a beautiful tradition we have and it's uh, a wonderful thing that we have a, a representative of the tradition coming here. I'm not aware of any uh, retreats having been held in the Korean, the pure K Korean tradition in Sweden before. Maybe there were one or two a long time ago. Um, it's a rare opportunity, so um, I hope you enjoy. And... Um, well, that's all I had to say. Thank you so much.